Did you know that in New York this very day, there are 20 acres of land completely uninhabited? There is a small island called North Brother Island, was used as an isolated ward for people dying of tuberculosis and smallpox. The notorious figure herself, Typhoid Mary, was once held there. This place, occupied by medical workers who would come in off the 4th Street Ferry, was a place where those suffering from terrible diseases of the time would be sent to die. It was marketed as a peaceful place for loved ones to rest while they suffered from these horrible diseases, when in reality, they lived stacked in apartments on top of each other, suffering in neglect and agony, drowning in their own lungs, suffering fevers, painful boils, and other terrible symptoms, till they died, were shuffled off and buried in mass graves. It is an interesting place to consider now that it is abandoned, at least by the living. New York considers it still isolated and quarantined as a quote-unquote potential health risk, when in reality there is a startling amount of unknown activity to be had. There are people who believe the island is haunted, patrolled and peopled by the spirits of those who suffered and died on the grounds, who were buried without going home to see their loved ones. People in the bay on ships have said that at night they could see lights moving about as if people were carrying lanterns on the shore. There are those who fished in the waters who said that they heard screams on the wind or felt a sense of despair, a paralyzing fear of death, or this terrifying sensation that they would be alone forever and they would become stronger in these sensations as they move closer to the island. In 2018, they sent drones to aerially survey the land, and somehow the airborne vessels were struck and knocked out by bricks. Some of these vessels, two or three hundred feet in the air at the time, while none of the buildings and the facilities there were taller than a hundred feet. A curious action for an abandoned place. So it came upon a hand of a few urban explorers to make a day trip of it. They hopped on a small boat, evaded coastal patrols, made their way into the land, dragged their boats on shore and hid them, and planned to stay the night. They stationed and explored. They took GoPro footage and cell phones, walked the whole foot space of the island, which wasn't very big, analyzed the buildings, the structures and things, and wondered at the sight of nature having reclaimed so much of it. Trees growing out of buildings, ancient ivy curling up into brick-and-mortar structures, looking as one accounts the world would after humanity has passed, and nature has reclaimed everything that we've taken. And then at night, became a different picture. There were screams, a sense of observation. One of the men broke rank and went to relieve himself in the privacy of the bushes. And his friends heard screaming from the other side of the island. And when they found him the following morning, he was dressed in a hospital gown, tucked into one of the island's many open graves. His body appeared as if it had been ravaged by disease. There was no explanation when they went back to the mainland and attempted to bring attention to this. The uh, various governing bodies of New York insisted that they bite their tongues on the subject. So, in these times of plague, of corona, of suffering, and hiding inside of our homes to avoid what's outside, just remember, could be worse. You could endure years' worth of suffering over the span of a night on a haunted island surrounded by death. These are dark times. And these stories come from very dark places. <laughs> Thank you.
Good evening, listeners. My name is Jonas Armitage, and you're listening to Stories from Dark Places. We are halfway through the month, around just about two weeks until Halloween, the great celebration of all things spooky, graces our city streets and neighborhoods. I don't know how they are in your area, but around Innsmouth, people are gearing up as much as you would expect them for Christmas or something like that. There's no sign of the pandemic in sight here, Everyone is shopping for costumes and preparing to trick-or-treat themselves around the neighborhood. And while this is somewhat disconcerting given the state of the plague and all, it is an endearing sight from these, at times, standoffish people. I am in some capacity looking forward to seeing what this holiday heralds for us all. So what do you do for Halloween? Do you tuck yourselves in and watch spooky movies with your friends and loved ones? Do you trick or treat? Do you cajole children in the neighborhood out of their bags of candy? Or do you go out on adventures looking for something sp- something to jazz your night up with an event to remember? Tonight's story is a similar telling of the sorts about three young men who go out on Halloween night against the wishes of their caregiver, looking for an experience, and what they find is most unexpected. And we'll be with you with tonight's story, The Halloween Pony, right after this message from our sponsors. Hi, this is Danielle from WZHP. When I'm looking for a comfortable place to take the whole family to eat dinner, but I don't want to break the bank, I go to Abby's. Serving the downtown Innsmouth area since 1957, Abby's is a rustic diner that specializes in American comfort food. Whether it's those deep fried peanut butter and pickle sandwiches you saw in that diner food show, or niche northern cuisine like Alaskan skinheads, or even if you just want a hot slice of stargazy pie, Abby's has it all. Abby's on the corner of Martins Avenue and 12th Street West. Show your membership to Marsh Hall and get a slice of stargazy pie a la mode on the house. Grandmother put another log on the fire. Outside, the little house which was not far from the sea, the wind was howling so fiercely that it set the windows rattling. Listen to that, said the old woman. There's a storm brewing for sure. She stirred the coals in the fireplace with a heavy poker until the new log caught and began to blaze. Satisfied, she turned to her three grandsons, who were sitting on the floor, gazing thoughtfully into the flames. Besides, she added, this is Halloween. Witches are abroad tonight, and the goblins, who are their servants, are wandering around in all sorts of disguises, looking for children to snatch away. But Tom, the eldest boy, said, I won't stay here, frightened of a little wind in old stories. I promised Colette I'd call on her tonight. She swore she wouldn't get a wink of sleep if I didn't visit her before the moon has gone down. I have to go and catch lobsters and crabs, said the middle boy, Louis. Not all the witches and goblins in the world will keep me from that. All three brothers announced they were going out for one reason or another, and ignored the warnings of their grandmother. Only the youngest child hesitated a minute when she said to him, You stay with me, my little Richard, and I'll tell you stories of fairy lands and magic animals. But he wanted to pick blackberries by the moonlight, and so he ran out after his brothers. He caught up with them on the rise beneath the old oak tree. Grandmother talks about wind and storm, but I've never seen the weather finer or the sky more clear. I'll bring home plenty of crabs and lobsters tonight. See how big the moon is, said Tom. Perhaps I can coax Colette to go for a walk with me. Then Richard, who was starting for the blackberry patch, suddenly cried, Look! And he pointed to a little black pony standing quietly at the foot of the hill. The ho, said Lewis. That's old Frederick's pony. It must have escaped from its stable and it's going down for a drink at the horse pond. Now, now, my pretty little pony, said Tom, going up and patting the creature with his hand. You mustn't run away. I'll lead you to the pond myself. With these words, he jumped on the pony's back. Take me too, called Lewis, and his brother helped him up. Don't leave me behind, cried Richard, and his brothers helped him mount. Soon all three were astride the little black pony, which waited patiently till they had settled themselves. Tom clung to the pony's neck. Lewis held Tom's waist, and Richard held Lewis's shirt. Now giddy up, urged Tom and the little pony headed directly for the horse pond. 
On their way, each brother met a friend and invited him to mount the pony. Soon there were six boys holding on to one another and laughing. The pony didn't seem to mind the extra weight, but pranced merrily along under the brilliant moon. The faster it trotted, the more the boys enjoyed the fun. They dug their heels into the pony's sides and called out, Gallop, little horse! You've got six of the bravest riders in the world on your back! Soon they were racing along through the grassy fields near the seashore. The wind rose, sending clouds scuttling across the face of the moon and whipping the pony's long black mane back across the eyes of the boys in front. Very close now, they could hear the waves pounding against the rocky shore. The pony didn't mind the noise at all. Instead of going to the horse pond, he circled around and cantered rapidly towards the seashore. Lewis, the middle brother, began to regret his wish to catch crabs and lobsters, and Richard, the youngest, found that he was no longer interested in blackberries. Both held on to their seats on the pony that was galloping at breakneck speed toward the beach. The eldest boy, Tom, seized the madly charging pony by the mane and tried to make it turn around. But he tugged and tugged in vain, for the pony galloped faster as the howling wind straight on toward the sea, pausing only when the first wave splashed over its hooves. The six riders thought to slip off the pony's back while it lingered at the water's edge, but they found they were stuck fast to the creature's back. Then, rearing up once more, the little black pony neighed loudly, ran back and forth through the safe foam gleefully, then suddenly charged into the billowing waves while its riders cried out in terror. The pony advanced farther and farther into the sea. The waves rose higher and higher until they covered the children's heads, and the pony vanished beneath the waves. Some say the children were drowned. Some say the goblin pony carried them to a strange city of coral and pearl at the bottom of the sea. But they were never seen on dry land again. Could you imagine living in a time in the world where you could just disappear like that? Or where people would just write it off? What happened to Tom? Oh, I guess he's been taken by goblins, the little rascal. Amazing to think that there was a time that we were not only so blinded by the concept of supernatural things everywhere, but we were so ready to accept them, to accept that they simply happened as a force of nature to us. You know, we live in a much more stern time where such things are ignored and they're not concepts that we embrace. But there is a part of me that wonders if those forces still exist to this day, waiting for proper moments. Well, I hope you enjoyed our story tonight. I would like to thank our sponsor, Abby's, for paying us to continue our little broadcast and share our stories with you. If you would like to advertise your business, your podcast, your passion project, your love, your entertainment, whatever, we invite you to reach out to us by email at storiesfromdarkplaces at gmail.com on Twitter, storiesfromdar1 or it's wherever you find us on social media, podcasts, or the internet at large. Even if it's not for that, we'd still love to hear from you. The reason we do this, we put our stories out, is because we want to share them with our listeners. We appreciate every one of you for taking the time to be with us on the nights when we reach out. Anyway, that's all the time we have tonight. Good night, listeners. And remember... The next time you find yourself out walking under the full moon and you espy a dark stallion patiently waiting to invite you for a night ride, remember, there's nothing to be afraid of. After all, some of the best things only happen in the dark. Stories from Dark Places was recorded before an imaginary studio audience. All stories performed on this podcast have expressed written consent from the original author. Jonas Armitage, his studio manager, and the entire staff of WZHP Radio Innsmouth are fictitious characters, and it's probably for the best that you continue to believe that.